Welcome to The Knife Show, where we dissect the human psyche and society. I am Joyce, and I'm an INFJ. My name is Denzel Mensa, and I'm an ENFJ. And today, we are going to be talking about the five love languages. I think the biggest thing that you guys need to know, first and foremost, was that this is a book written by Gary Chapman, and it's the secret to love that lasts, is what Gary, how Gary Chapman describes it. And this became very popular. There's even a website where you can check it out and you can take the quiz on find out what your love languages are. So that's five, like the actual number five, lovelanguages.com. But I think that it's a very popular thing that, you know, you most likely have heard of the love languages before. Um, you've probably watched other YouTube videos on it and you're like, oh, here's yet another YouTube video on it. But I think that Joyce and I will be able to present a lot of um, keen insights on what the love languages are, at least according to our experiences, um, and how to continue to make use of them in your relationships every day. Um, so number one, we'll go ahead and we'll list off the five love languages, and then we're going to start talking about what each one may mean um, when it's in giving and when it's receiving. So one of the biggest things that I found out um, for myself and or as I talk to more people over the years is that I think that usually like when you take the test, the love languages, it gives you like the order. And I remember I used to assume that, oh, it's the same giving and receiving. But I think it was just last year that I started to like think more. Like I actually believe that giving can often be different than how you'd want to receive. Um, and as I checked in with more people, I realized like, you know, I have an INTJ who she loves receiving acts of service, but she doesn't like giving acts of service, which makes sense because when she explained it, she's like, I mean, come on now. Um, you like me receiving acts of service is me having a burden lifted off of me. Like that's a few, one less thing or a few less things that I have to do. So why would I go pick up someone else's burden to do for them like that that kind of like cancels it out um and to me that makes sense you know so and there's some people who may not really be good at giving words of affirmation but they love to receive it from other people you know and then there's other people you know who may not be good at giving gifts but they love to receive gifts um so yeah there's just a lot of different um layers to these love languages and i think that as we go through this um you should be thinking about what your order is, not only in what you'd like to receive, but also how you like to give. And I think that if people understand that in your life, both what you, how you like to give it and how you like to receive it, and then working on how to speak all of the love languages, languages, because um, this was not made for you to learn how to, to teach other people how to love you. It was mainly made, according to uh, Chapman, to learn how to love other people. So if we all learn how to love each other in the way that we want to be, to the, in the way that the other people want to be loved, then you don't really have to learn, you don't really have to focus so much on them, you know, scratching your back because they kind of will already be doing that um, if you're in a healthy and genuine relationship. So definitely just make sure that as much as you're learning about the receiving, also learn about the giving, learn about the people that you have in your life that you love and what they, how they like to receive love so that you can speak their love language more efficiently and more effectively. And so before we get into defining them, do you have any questions or do you have any uh, comments, Joyce, that you might like to add or anything? Yeah, love languages is one of the topics that I'm endlessly fascinated by. So I think we could do a million episodes on this just from different perspectives. And I think it would spill up, it, it, like there's an essays upon essays of thoughts I have specifically on this topic, depending on where you wanna approach it. So yeah. I'm excited for the topic. It's what I think about all the time because I'm always thinking about how can I love someone better? And how can I understand what love is better? And so to have these kind of frameworks to understand individual differences is really important because it makes you realize that people aren't carbon copies of you. You know, something that typology teaches us is neurodiversity, that mm -hmm. diversity doesn't 
just exist on the outside. Like there are a lot of movements like Black Lives Matter, which, you know, showcases the diversity that we have externally. It's like you can see actual like racial diversity, but oftentimes personality diversity, you can't see it. So it's harder for people to acknowledge. But personality differences also cause a huge amount of conflict too and unfairness. And so I think models like the five love languages really help you understand the neurodiversity behind people. Like you can't really see these differences on the outside, but they make all the world of differences in relationships after 10, 20, 30 years of dealing with these love languages differences. You notice that people will really struggle to communicate without understanding these models like sometimes people understand the five love languages without really even calling it the five love languages you kind of need to understand that people are intrinsically different and taking things differently in order to get along with people mm -hmm. it's almost like the golden rule versus the platinum rule the golden rule is treat others the way you want to be treated which is our natural inclination so we're like, oh, you know, if I like words of affirmation, I'm just going to give it to everyone. Mm -hmm. Whereas exactly. if you understand the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they want to be treated, then you understand, hey, some people don't like words of affirmation. And maybe a better way of approaching it is helping them take off a task off of their to-do list through acts of service, like for Denzel's TJ friend. And that can help you love them better. And so I ultimately find models like MBTI or the love languages or other ones that you know about, they help us understand less explicit forms of diversity. And they help us figure out ways to love people better or communicate with them better or heal in a better way too. And I'm all for that. So mm -hmm. let's yeah. get into the topic. So the love languages are quality time, words of affirmation, acts of service, physical touch, and gifts. You could probably get an idea of what they all mean just based off of the name, but to everyone, they might mean different things. Now, of course, gifts is probably more self-explanatory, but when you go to something more um, abstract rather than tangible, you know, like quality time, quality time might mean different things to different people. So you have to figure out what that might be. Um, and that's what makes some of these love languages like possibly a little bit harder um, when you go from the more concrete ones like acts of service to the more abstract ones like, uh, again, quality time, maybe even words of affirmation kind of thing. So we're going to break these down and talk about them from our own understanding and from our uh, own experiences there and how you can not only um, show or express these love languages on your own to your partner or to your friends, but also how you can best maybe be receptive to them. Um, and if you're even receiving a love language is probably not high up on your own stacking, um, to be able to still view it as love from the other person. Um, and if you need to communicate to that person like, hey, I appreciate that you're giving me gifts, but I actually would appreciate more like more words of affirmation or I'd actually appreciate more like, you know, whatever. Then, you know, you could communicate that. And of course, you know, they're not capable because it's something that's just very difficult for them. Then you can also, you know, maybe find a way to appreciate what they're able to give just as hopefully they'll be able to appreciate what you're able to give. Because there are people out there who, you know, just because of how they are, like they're not really able to speak the other love languages as effectively. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. Everyone is different. So it, just because you might be able to speak all of them, depending on who you're, you know, who you're interacting with, you can't hold everybody off to that standard. Um, and that doesn't mean they love you any less. That's a big thing to keep in mind. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about quality time. Joyce, what does quality time mean for you? Or what would you say it would mean in general and then for you actually? Yeah, so quality time, I interpret it as 
having undivided attention and time with that person. So actually someone going out of their way to make the time to spend it with you and that it is able to be used in a way where it, they're not divided in any way. So I kind of see quality time as just really making time to spend time with someone almost as if let's say there's a couple together and they make out 10 minutes a day to just spend it sipping tea and talking about stuff so it's like purposefully sectioning out quality time to spend together but yeah what is your definition of it before i get into my experience of quality yeah time? for sure i actually agree with you i think that quality time um, is essentially time spent with a person. And I think it can be one-on-one -on -one or it can be in a small intimate group because I know that I know that people often, and of course, you know, maybe it's the extrovert in me. Um, I know that people often like to trash on groups <laughs> uh, and, and minimize the quality of them. Um, and I think that oftentimes it could be because by nature, it's harder to get groups to be on one page and to become more intimate. But I've been in groups where, in a group to me, I think that is anything three people or more. So I think that I've been in groups where it's like three to five people, sometimes even like you know eight to 10. And when they're all on the same page about, you know, what we're talking about, we're all listening to each other very closely and we're all like there for each other in that way. And we're spending time together in that way. Like, I think that there's a lot of quality there that maybe we don't get to see often with people um, or like when we think of groups because we just think of loud and, you know, chaotic and stuff like that but when we when we're able to actually have those rare moments where a group is like all on one page and they're all paying attention to each other equally and they're all sharing and expressing what they feel i think that there's a lot of quality that can be found there and that's how you know people kind of click up that's how they they, they build um what the greeks used to call uh oh no i can't remember the exact one it was just in my head ah uh, it was, well, it's not pragma. Um, is it phil philia? Can't remember the exact one anymore, but it was, it's, it's the love of, of, it's the love that's built when you are, when you're with maybe like a team or when you are out with your soldiers, for example, um, and you are fighting a good fight, you know, like that's the kind of love that's built there. And that's, that's still a quality love. Like if I was with, soldiers and we were fighting for the country and we, we were about to die give our lives and like i was about to like you know drown and then like five of them like save me and we're together and we're just talking about the experience that we had earlier and how each of us could have died but then yo roderick had my back and this and we're like all on one page like that that is quality time in my opinion um but i do think that it's of course a lot more easy and perhaps even ideal for a lot of people to have more one-on-one -on -one, because that's easier to manage every time a new person is joined into the dynamic then the dynamic inevitably will change um and so you have to be aware of like okay now we can talk about this but we probably can't talk about this because it all depends on like you know how comfortable they are around each other maybe um one person hasn't built enough comfort with another person and they haven't cultivated that enough and you know, it, it takes time to do that. It takes intentionality to do that. Um, and so it's just easier to instead have that quality time one-on-one. -on -one. I think that both though can be very valuable. So in essence, yeah, quality time to me can be group or one-on-one, -on -one, um, or I believe that it could be group or one-on-one. -on -one. And um, it's mainly a time where uh, for some people, it's literally just, being around the person like oh you're reading your book and i'm playing my video game you know and we're not even saying anything to each other but we're in the same presence and we're just around each other and we're just doing our own thing for some people that wouldn't be enough quality for them that wouldn't be considered quality times like 
we need to engage. We need to have some conversation. We need to be intimate in a way that's, you know, uh, verbal, you know, and like allowing us to actually like make time with the quality. Like some people, again, it's like, oh, we're engaging with each other, but maybe we're not talking with each other. Like we're, we're out on roller coasters and, you know, stuff like that. But it's like, I'm having all of these adventures with you. And so therefore it's more quality, you know? So essentially, like, again, it could mean different things to different people, but it's because quality itself is an abstract term. <laughs> so the time that you're spending with that person, like, you know, what, what makes it quality to you? Um, and that's where it would come down to different things for different individuals. So if you're dealing with someone in particular, you have to figure out like, okay, what would make this time quality for you? And then you ask yourself that, like, what would make this time quality for me? Um, and how much do I value that? Uh, so that's essentially how I view quality time. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Denzel. And so quality can depend on the kind of mood you're in as well. So specifically, sometimes there's a healing effect of being around someone's presence and not really talking like what Denzel was saying. And the reason for that is there's a certain type of co-regulation. So to feel psychologically safe, sometimes we have to feel like we fit in with people or with a group. And so if being around certain people enhances your feeling of psychological safety or feeling like it's home, or just being in someone's space can be incredibly he healing or therapeutic or quality because it gives you the effect of co-regulating your nervous system. And so that can be quality time, just being around someone you trust and care about. It can really have healing properties to your body. And so other ways to have quality time too, specifically if this concept is applied to me, is through quality of conversation. I oftentimes am a very private and guarded person, so it takes a lot of time to actually hear my perspective on topics because I just assume that I'm a little bit invisible or that I'm like a fly on the wall or that my existence shouldn't isn't really that valued in places. And so I oftentimes keep my opinion to myself. So I may have a very like abstract unpacking of a topic, but it takes a lot of time for me to warm up or defrost in order for me to share it. So to me, quality time can be how much have we actually heard our real opinions of, of what we think of this topic. So getting past the defrosting and actually getting into the conversation, no aspect of it, and actually sorting through the theory and getting past the, what do you call it, the pleasantries or the, the niceties and actually getting to the theoretical complexity of the topic. There's a certain level of psychological safety I need to be able to unpack theoretical complexities with someone. And I realized that. And I don't exactly know how to fix that, but I realized like as an introvert, when someone actually is able to get past the barriers that I naturally put up, but I don't even know that I put up and we're actually able to like, I'm actually able to get to a place where I feel safe. That's when the time starts to feel like quality time. When the atmosphere is safe enough for us to either just be around each other's company and still bask in that safeness, or that I feel safe enough to tell you my true opinions about things, which is still like the prerequisite to quality time is this level of safety. Another piece of quality time too is that it's not there for the sake of convenience. Because a lot of people spend time together just because it's convenient. But for me, something that makes something quality is intentionality and purpose. And so if it's not intentional and if they're not doing it because they enjoy to do it or it's purposeful for them to do it, it's kind of like just a thing that is easy for them to do. That is not quality time to me because that's more like fast food time. It's like, oh, you're just doing it because it's quick and easy that doesn't say that you like being around me or you like being around this group, that you're just doing this because you have no other options. And there's nothing special about that. And so 
I think another component to quality time is that there's some element of unspoken or spoken specialness to it. So it's like, it's either you like the, even the unspoken time together because the relationship you have between you two is special. And so even just being around this person, it feels special and sacred because you you have this unspoken, we get each other. It's a, it's great that we get to spend this time together. Or it's special in, in a group setting because you guys know that you all respect and love each other. Or it's special in a one, di one dynamic because you know that you're special to each other. And so no matter what you're doing, you know that there's a reason for why you guys are here. And so, yeah, what makes quality time quality to me is both safety and a feeling of feeling special in the relationship too. I love everything that you said, um, <clears throat> especially about the convenience thing. I think that if it's just like, oh, oh yeah, you're around, so sure. You know what I mean? Like that's, that there's definitely something there for sure. But it's not. It's like. It's 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 it. It doesn't mean as much as I choose you. I think that's that to me is like what makes quality time quality. It's like, I could be doing these other things, um, but I choose you, and There's not just for list. you. Yeah, like I I I I enjoy you. I because I enjoy you. I want to spend time with you, not because it's convenient. Sometimes I might even go out of my way. Intentionality, the more intentionality that's there, it's like, hey, let's do this today. Let's do that, you know? And I love also what you said about like getting to a point where it's like, it can be unspoken. Because for me, for example, I'm not against the idea of like, oh, you know, me and somebody else are just hanging out in the same vicinity and we're doing our own thing kind of thing. But I think it has to be built up to that point. Because to me, it's like, well, I could do that with anyone. <laughs> like I can go to the library and then have quality time with everyone there in the library, you know? Like they're all doing their own thing, you know? But if I have a, a, a deep bond, a deep intimacy in a relationship with you, then we don't have to talk all the time because we've already done that. We've cultivated it, we've built it. So now we can just relax in what we've built. If you, if you haven't built the hammock together, if you haven't strung together that hammock, then how are you supposed to relax in it? You know what I mean? But if you've taken the time to weave together a hammock for the both of you um, or for your group, then you can relax in that and you don't have to say anything. You can just nap and that's that's quality time. You know, you're not gonna just let anybody into that hammock. That's y'all's hammock, um, but it needs to be woven together and that takes time. It's a special um, hammock. It's a special hammock, exactly. So that's why like, you know, there's a meme sometimes it's like you know real friends take naps together and it's like you know <laughs> i think that's a real statement you know like like that's because because when you're sleeping together not sleeping together but, <laughs> but when you're like napping <laughs> together then um it, there's there's a special intimacy there um because it's 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 peaceful it's safe it's it's uh it's it's it is an unspoken it is silent um and that that just brings a lot uh yeah to mind but i do think that uh quality time for me is all of what i just said and all of what you just said um and especially just like i'm so much about exploring intimacy with people like like every moment of the day i want i want to spend it in intimacy um so I, I want to continue to explore the person's mind. Um, I'm not gonna have like just idle conversation. Like I want us to be making progress. Um, and like I said, if we've made a lot of progress and everything, sometimes stuff still needs to process. Like, you know, so we don't always have to just keep on building. Sometimes like, all right, we built a lot of our hammock today. Maybe it's not even done yet, but we have enough to be able to relax in. So I'm gonna relax in this after a hard day of work, hard day work. And we can just chill in that, and the, in a way that's kind of still. This is where the metaphor falls apart, but it's kind of still building the hammock in that moment, almost like telepathically. <laughs> um, so that's yeah, that's kind of like what uh, quality time is for me. And it's like because if I'm able to build that foundation with the person and have that intimacy with the person, 
then it can bleed into all different areas where it is the unspoken, where we are just having adventures and stuff like that. Um, but if we haven't built that foundation up to that point, if we haven't built that hammock, uh, or at least enough of the hammock to where we can lay in it, then the time that we are spending with each other is not really going to be as secure for me. It's not going to be as quality for me. It's not going to be something that I, I would consider to be in depth. Yeah. And another component to why just being in someone's space or just sleeping with them, napping with them or spending time with them is so amazing is it's intimate because you're taking down your mask around them. Because when you're sleeping, you can't put on that good face sometimes. Or when you're just on your phone, you're not trying to be this impressive person. But they like all sides of you. So they like the you when you're impressive. They like the you when you're relaxed. They like the you when you're being silly, goofy. And the you when you're just breathing and doing nothing. So basically... Intimacy isn't just putting on your best face all the time. Sometimes we can feel the most close to someone when they're doing their day-to-day -day things with us and they trust us to still love them, even if they're just being dumb, but the version of them that no one else sees because they want to look impressive in front of them. I don't know. There's an intimate element to feeling like you don't have to impress someone for a, mo a moment of time. Because you feel like you don't have to be someone for them. And a lot of, oftentimes we can feel kind of drained trying to impress people or drained trying to put on our best face. So there's something incredibly naked about just being able to unmask and not worry about the repercussions of unmasking. I 100% agree with everything that you said there once again. Um, and that unmasking, I mean, you know, I talk about it on my channel all the time. Uh, and quality time is my number one love language, both for giving and receiving. So I'm, I would probably be talking about this forever. Like you said, I can make a whole video just on that alone. But um, <clears throat> yeah, like the unmasking is always just, that's, that's the intimacy that I'm seeking. Like I want us to be in a space where we are 1000% comfortable. I don't have to, I don't have to censor myself. You don't have to censor yourself, both physically and emotionally. Uh, spiritually, verbally, you know, whatever, like it's, we're just, we're good. You know what I mean? Um, that to me describes how intimate, how close we truly are. And it doesn't have to, it's, it's never, it never should be a rushed thing. But if everything is leading to that, then I think that that's, that's what's rewarding for me. Um, and like I said, that could be harder to do when you are in a group. So I understand why people can be like, oh yeah, you know, groups, blah, blah, blah. I prefer one-on-one. -on -one. And I get that. I personally do prefer one-on-one -on -one myself, but I wouldn't I wouldn't try to like trash on the groups either because I've seen quality groups be able to build that. And it's just like, it's all about finding the right people and and being able to properly impose that will. And if, if the people are about it and they y'all have the intentionality, it can happen. Um, so that's that's one of my thoughts there. Yeah, and that brings us to conversational intimacy. You talked about being with people where you don't feel like you have to censor yourself. And so oftentimes there, something that I really seek in close friendships and also in a eventual romantic partnership too is someone who I can tell everything to. And that's because there's an intimacy without needing to hinder yourself in some sort of way. And so quality time is also feeling like you don't have to walk on eggshells or a minefield sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. And so for our next love language that we're going to be talking about, acts of service. So Joyce, what would you say or how would you define acts of service? It's when you do things for other people. So it's when you kind of someone, let's say they have to do the laundry that day and you do the laundry for them or you help them with taking off items off of their to-do list. It's almost showing love through actions. So when you bake someone something, that could be an act of service or it could be a gift too, depending on if you're gifting them the item too. 
So acts of service is love through uh, demonstrating it through your actions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I think that acts of service is is pretty much a straightforward one. I like the way that um, my friend put it when you are relieving a burden for someone. Like if you know that someone needs to wash the dishes or someone needs to do the laundry, someone needs their car washed, you know, someone like whatever it might be like, if someone needs to make a run to the grocery store, like, and, and you're just like, hey, you know, I'll handle that for you. That's an act of service that you've just helped relieve. You've taken something off of that person's to-do list. Um, and a lot of people will deeply appreciate that from you because it makes their life easier. You know, and if you make their life easier, then why would they not want to keep you around? <laughs> you know, but then on top of that, uh, a lot of times like that, that's that's expressing to them, that's communicating to them that, wow, you prioritized me enough to even at your own expense, because if you're putting another burden on yourself, then you're it's pretty much at your own expense. But you're doing that for me. That must say a lot about how much you love me kind of thing. So that's the. That's the thing that's being communicated, in my opinion, when it comes to acts of service. Um, and I do also believe that a lot of times it's, it's, it's another intentionality thing. Like this is something that I was confused about recently because I think especially as an FE Dom, I, I do acts of service, in my opinion, all the time. Uh, I just, you know, it's a lot of it goes under the radar and it's not like an intentional kind of like, oh, I'm trying to be under the radar kind of thing. It's just, it's just how I am um, where like, you know, I might, yeah, I, I just do things that a lot of people I believe don't notice that I did for them, but I also don't do it for them to notice. Um, however, uh, it was brought to my attention that, you know, if the person didn't notice that you did the thing for them or that that thing was done, then it's probably not really an act of service. Um, I mean, you, you did service them, but you didn't really lighten their burden possibly. Like, um, so it's, it's probably better to just ask the person like what they actually need to get done because then that's actually, you know, like lightening their load. Um, and so act, so acts of service people will, will often ask like, Hey, is there anything I can do? Or like, like they'll, they'll be keen to noticing like what it is that you actually need done. And then they will offer to help for you. And a lot of times I do believe they do it right in front of you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I would describe acts of service. Um, and yeah, in a nutshell, both in giving and receiving. Yeah. And there can sometimes be anti acts of service too. So one day we can have a knife show episode where we talk about the opposites of these love languages. So mm -hmm. for instance, um, today I took my dog to the vet and I was with my ISTJ dad and he was getting really frustrated because I gave the wrong address to the location. And that's like increasing the amount of burdens on his to-do list. And so mm -hmm. he had a hiss with it the entire time. He was just really pissed off. Mm -hmm. and so my ISTJ dad's first love language is probably acts of service. And I totally missed the mark with that. And I gave him an anti-acts of service through making his life harder for him. Wow. And so, yeah, acts of service is one that's not very valued by me. Uh, I think it's typically also because people have a hard time predicting what is a burden to me and predicting what is not a burden to me. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone's tried to lighten the load for me, they've either made it neutral. So it's not something that would have made my life easier in any way. And I also like words of affirmation. So if they complain while doing the acts of service for me, it counteracts my dominant love language where I'm like, your bad mood while helping me with this acts of service totally counteracted the effects of you going out of your way to do something for me. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just kind of shows that there are different love languages at play too. So you may think that you're helping with one, whereas if someone else values another one, you may actually be hurting the cause. And so like the reverse anti 
love language for me is when people do words of affirmation poorly. So they do something where they say things that are a little bit hurtful or critiquing or complaining or that rub the emotional mood in the wrong way. Mm. That is an anti love language to me. And so I find acts of service sometimes can go against that cause, especially in Asian families where they don't prioritize words of affirmation and they really care about acts of service in traditional Asian households. I think that that would be a good episode to do sometime. Maybe even right after this episode one day, we can do that because that's probably not something that I hadn't thought about that. Um, it makes sense to me as soon as you state it, but yeah, like the thinking about the anti uh, the anti love languages that that makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah, if you add a burden to someone else's plate and there are things like acts of service, yeah, now it's like a it's a hate it's a hate language now. <laughs> it's like, oh, so you just want to make my life harder now, <laughs> you know, instead of making my life easier. Like, if you're saying mean words to a person who's high on words of affirmation, then what you're communicating to them is hate. <laughs> like. Oh, so you you hate me, you know, like you you don't like me. You, this is you know whatever. So yeah, I think that 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 would be an interesting thing to explore for all five of them in an, in a different video as well, because that's something that you know a lot of people probably don't think about. Um, but yeah, moving on. Uh, since you brought it up, let's go with words of affirmation. Um, how would you describe words of affirmation for you, especially it being your dominant one? Yeah, words of affirmation and quality time take the tie for my dominant love languages. I would say any of the love languages, if they're enacted upon in a way that's intentional, purposeful, and it shows that they're attentive to my essence, then I could value any of the love languages. But yes, words of affirmation hit me in a different way. I oftentimes really like when people say out loud that they love me or care about me. And I'm starved of that in an Asian household because I've never heard my parents ever say I love you to me. And they also don't hug me at all too. So it's implied, the love is implied, but you don't really get to know it in any empirical way. Words of affirmation, it is being able to vocalize appreciation. So either through warmth of tonality or through the way that you say it, you convey tenderness towards the other person. So it is very reassuring in the sense that you're being told it. And so there's not a lot of ambiguity there. And so that's the reason why it's one of my top love languages, because it's taking away all of the grayness or the fogginess of it. And it's saying, hey, I actually really like these things about you. You don't have to stay in the dark about what I like about you because I like these things about you. And this is why you're irreplaceable to me. This is why you're indispensable to me. This is why you're unforgettable to me. And them being able to explain their mind. I guess the reason why I like words of affirmation is because people can also convey the, the reasons in their worldview for why you're important to them. And because, you know, with the NIFE, I like exploring people's minds so much when people use words of affirmation and they are able to use it in an elegant way, they can convey to me the rooms within their mind. And I'm like, oh, right. There's something very beautiful and enticing about the reasons for why this relationship is special to me or why I'm special to you. And so it fulfills that need for, understanding the complexity within someone's mind and how they think about things and how they think about the relationship and how they think about me and them. And so it hits on so many points of depth. I've always been a person who likes words because words can convey abstract concepts more thoroughly. And so when someone is able to almost use words in a way that is so tactful that they're able to both hit on the abstract elements of why they like you and also the other elements. To me, that kind of ability to almost convey in a passionate way your love for someone is very attractive because words can also have a hidden passion in them too. And I like having a kind of fire to the relationship or having a kind of like 
a relationship that's always in the honeymoon stage. So this is the idealist in me speaking, but I think that relationships do not have to expire past the honeymoon phase. I think maybe you might lose some of the new object syndrome of it, but I think that a relationship can always kind of feel like it's in its honeymoon phase. And that's if you're able to keep exploring people's minds. Because if a person keeps growing, then you'll always be exploring new versions of them. And how can you get bored when there's always new versions of them to explore? They're a house that always renovates. They're a house that always builds new rooms. And how can you get bored of a mansion that keeps expanding itself? So you're in this place with many escape rooms or many puzzles, but they never run out of puzzles. They just keep increasing in the amount of puzzles or labyrinths within them. And so I find words of affirmation to be very affirming because you get to explore another person's mind through their words and they get to tell you in their words the rooms in their minds and how it links to their affection for you. And so it's just a very direct way to convey to someone that they matter to you. And that's why I like it because I'm the type of person sometimes when there's ambiguity, I'm, I might doubt things or I might say, huh, is that really real? So that words of affirmation is that final nail or that final straw in that camel's back that secures, hey, for sure, I love you and I will be there for you. And it's a way of calming down those doubts I have of relationships failing. That's That was beautiful. Um, yeah, for me, uh, in receiving, uh, quality time and words of affirmation are pretty much equal um, for me. So I also really agree. I put a lot of weight on people's words. Like even if I don't believe what somebody's saying, I believe that they believe what they're saying. And that's the most important thing to me. Like, even if the person's like, you are my best friend. If I at least believe that they believe what they're saying, it's like, oh, you're my best friend. I will never leave you kind of thing. Okay, cool. Um, and so I, I think I also come from it at the angle of like, I know that people be like, actions speak louder than words. Um, and I don't want to say I disagree with that, but I think that we shouldn't negate uh, how much words can also be as well, because like me, I, I'm a nice guy <laughs> or I'd like to think so, but there's a lot of things, you know, I've done in the past where it's like, again, like my acts of service, I suppose, where I'm just, I'm just being a nice guy and like whatever. And then somebody could interpret all of my actions in a way and then think like, yeah, you know, I'm Denzel's best friend or, <laughs> or yeah, you know, Denzel, like, is in love with me or whatever. And I, if I literally just say the words, I never said that. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I did to an extent. I didn't say it. So it's invalid. You interpreted that that way. So if words are really cheap, then that's not really, you know, like, like if I never said it, then I can't be incriminated for it, you know? But if I told you straight up, like, hey, you're my best friend or hey, I'm in love with you or whatever. Even if I, my actions weren't showing it, I could still be incriminated for that, you know? Now, I believe that actions and words should be aligned for sure. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, especially, and that's when both are most powerful, of course. But yeah, I'm, I'm big on words of affirmation. I was known um, growing up for being that guy, like who my closest friends, they looked forward to, my happy birthday messages to them um, because I, I wrote a long paragraph just going into detail of how much they mean to me, why I'm so appreciative of them being born and this is that, which to a lot of people could be like, oh, come on. But to me, it's like, I want you to know how much you really mean to me and why I chose you as a friend uh, at one of my birthday parties. It was my birthday. And I laughed because I didn't even notice that this was happening. But um, Jamila had assembled people for my birthday party. Um, and we were all sitting at the table. And after they had like sung happy birthday to me and everything, I literally went around the table to kind of like what you do, Joyce, at the end of your uh, videos. And I, I, I gave specific words of affirmation to each person. Like em Emrys was there. Um, and I was like, Emrys, this is why 
I appreciate you as a friend and boom, boom, boom. Like, thank you so much. David, I really appreciate you for coming today and just all of what you, like I went around the table like, dang, Denzel, this is your birthday. You're about to make us cry kind of thing. And it's not like a showboaty type of thing, but it's like, I want people to know how much they mean to me. And I want them to know that like, like explicitly, you know, I will give them the actions, but I want them to also like see the intensity behind it kind of thing. Um, so yeah, for words of affirmation, I also think I view it sometimes also as like words of information. <laughs> like I like to know, like, like I have a friend who, again, I didn't, I didn't like, I know that me and her, like we talk a lot. Um, well, no, well, we don't talk a lot. That's the thing. We don't talk a lot, but we talk every now and then. Um, and when we do talk, it is a great conversation. Um, but I was surprised when she was asked on Instagram one day, like, who's your best guy friend? Um, and she posted me and she tagged me in front of all of her followers. I was like, whoa, like that's, that's, I did not know that. <laughs> but I guess my words of affirmation was really expanded by that. And then by that, my actions began to align more. Like, well, if, if I already have this position, let me now prove it. Like, even more. Like, I know I'm already like your best guy friend. And I wasn't even trying <laughs> like, for being totally honest. But now that you're saying this, let me keep my title. Let me be even better of a friend to you. And that's the type of person that I am. Um, and so it, it's it's funny. Some Somebody else told me like more than anyone in their entire life, like I know them deeper than anyone else. And that surprised me too, which you know, it surprised the person that it surprised me, but <laughs> when it surprised me, <laughs> then I was like, wow. Well, in that case, I'm really glad. And now that I know, due to your words, watch this. Like, I'm going to probe even deeper, not 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 out of anything like cynical, but it's because I, I want to. Like, so that that type of information really does validate. And then it affirms where I'm at, where I stand with you as, you know, as a friend or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I really appreciate receiving words of affirmation because it's information for me to know where I stand with you. And that's what brings me security. Um, and I don't, I don't, depending on who you are is how frequently I would need it. If you're someone who's very fickle and, you know, like flighty and, you know, stuff like that. And you're just like, yeah, I love you and I love you. And you just, you're just like throwing it then I I need to understand like where, like what it really, like how valuable the words are to you so that I can gauge how valuable that I should hold on to them for myself kind of thing. But if you're someone who's very intentional with the words that you're using, um, like I, I made a video on like um, hollow flattery. I would not tell anybody who can't sing that they can sing just to make them feel good, no. I won't tell them that they suck unless they ask me, but I very much value honesty. So if I say to someone, you are my number one best friend, that means I took the time to really think like, okay, is this literal? Like, do I have all of my friends? Like, yeah. Like I'm going to say, and I want my words to be heavy, valuable, and, you know, just effective in that sense. And so I kind of like, kind of like what you said with the anti thing, um, if somebody cheapens those words, if somebody is kind of like, oh yeah, he always says that, or like they, they make it seem like I'm not really meaning what I say, or I don't really believe what I say, that hurts like hell. Um, and it, it, it infuriates me. Um, so, but in the same sense, when they can believe what I'm saying and they can receive it, even if they don't have anything to say back, which is another thing, I'm not saying whatever I'm saying to just get something back. I just want you to, to receive to just, yeah, to just receive and believe. Receive and believe. That's that's pretty much like what it comes down to when it comes to the words of affirmation for me um, in giving. And then when I'm receiving it, I just, once again, like, I just, I just like to know where I stand with you um, in an explicit way that won't have me insecure or questioning anything. I like how you put it as words of information. So I also use it as conveyors of truth too. 
So when I say something, I'm not lying to someone and I'm really trying to convey the, the truth to them. And it's also filled with love too, because there's extroverted feeling there, but everything I say is the honest truth. And so when people add words to, that I didn't say, and it adds a negative twist to my words of affirmation or the things that I said, it hurts a lot because I make sure to say only what I mean and mean what I say. And so when people create their own story or narrative of what it means and they turn a unicorn into, I don't know, trash, then it's hurtful because it was made with intentionality. It's like I made a gift for you. I decorated it with every piece meaning something. They took it and then they they shook it and then when they look inside the whole gifts like splattered everywhere because it was made in such a perfectly created way and they didn't handle what i gave to them with with care you know they they just treated the present like it was trash or something and so with words of affirmation i enjoy vulnerability behind words too so for instance uh, when someone would say things like, you know, if you, if you left, I would cry. And I was like, well, that's words of information. I believe you because I can see your personality aligning with those words. And there's something very vulnerable about that. I'm like, wow, you do care. Because sometimes I don't assume that I matter to people unless they say it explicitly too. Yes, so when they say stuff like that, I'm like, wow we are close. We are tight. It's not just made up in my head. Same, same, 100% on the same page. And that's why I take what people say so seriously before I'm like, okay, now I can really gauge your action. So it's like, you can spend all this time with me and this is that, but like, what if it's just for convenience, you know, or what if it's, you know, what if you got me this gift because you're just a gift giver and you just give gifts for everyone. Like, like what makes this special unique? Like, that I mean something to you, you know, kind of thing. Um, just like the acts of service thing that I was talking about, like I could be doing acts of service, but just without intentionality because I'm just a nice guy. So then, you know, somebody can misinterpret that, but I guess that's not like an actual intentional love as opposed to me, hey, do you need anything? Like, you know, kind of thing there that I've been practicing now with, you know, my TJ friend and I've, I've been really enjoying it. Um, trying to like actually love the person in the way that they best receive love uh but yeah if you don't say it i'm not i'm not I, i'm always going to have this kind of idea in my head like am i delusional like am i making this more than what it really is but if you say it that's information that i, I can hold on to um yeah and that's what makes it so meaningful and big to me so the next love language that we're going to be talking about right now is gifts gift giving, again, I believe this is kind of like a straightforward kind of love language. And so what makes this one pretty straightforward in the way that it is, is that, well, you are giving a gift to a person. But again, all of these love languages, in my opinion, what makes them a love language is the intentionality behind it. If you just go buy a pack of gum for someone's birthday and you just give it to them, unless if they really have a deep love for gum, <laughs> the, or there's like some kind of symbolism there. It's like, hey, remember that we used to eat five gum when we were uh, younger and this is like some meaning behind it. Like if there's not intentionality behind it, it's not really going to be an actual love language. But just think about somebody who gets you a gift that either was maybe crazy expensive and they might not even have that much money um, but they saved up so much for you or somebody who gets you a gift that wasn't even expensive at all, but they, they took so much time to craft it or both, you know, like maybe, maybe someone got you a gift that's like, they know that this is your favorite show, or they know how much you wanted this video game. They know, like, they know you, if you get somebody a gift that screams, I know you, I put thought and intention intentionality into this gift so that it could appeal directly to you, that's where the love language is at its highest peak. Um, and so that's essentially what I believe gifting 
is. Like it, it's the intentionality behind the gift. How much thought did you put into that gift to express your love for that person? Well put, Denzel. And so I was giving myself a therapy session to me over this love language today. Because this love language can go really deep, all of these love languages. Our love languages, our top ones, show how we read into what the person's action is. So each love language implies something differently to every person. And so with gifts, it's low in my love languages, but there have been points in which it could mean something a lot to me. Uh, so I'll give you the scenario. With my ENFP ex-best friend, she may like she really wanted to become a singer and a youtuber and so i bought her like five thousand dollars worth of you know a video camera a diva light and a professional microphone and i wanted to show her that i i loved her through giving her the kind of items she needed to succeed with what she wanted to do but for her it was an ne pondering so it's just something she was thinking about wanting to do but she changes the things that she loves and wants to do every few years and stuff but i realized that the reason why i did that was because i've always wanted someone to take a chance with me so i wanted someone to see me as trusting me enough or trusting my skills enough or trusting me as a human being enough to take a gamble with me, to take a chance with me. And so in that moment, I gave that to her too, because it's something that I've always secretly wanted myself. I wanted someone to put something on the line for me, that I was worth this uh, risk. And so I like to show those that I love that I'm willing to take a risk with them with sometimes expensive purchases that could help forward them in their dream or in something because I trust in their ability to be that great and I can see them like I could see her becoming a great singer and a great youtuber and all she needs is the stuff and so I I don't think I'll ever receive that gift from someone I don't think ever anyone's ever going to care about me enough to do that or have the love language in that specific way that will provide that to me. But I realized that that's like a really emotionally hidden need that I have that I know gifts can seem very superficial on the onset, but it can really look at these like innermost needs to feel seen and heard through objects that enable you to feels that way or that they can help you in some sort of way to reach certain things or they can symbolize something like someone can get you a snow globe and it symbolizes your beauty to them and that could be a beautiful gift too and so Denzel your thoughts and ideas yeah yeah no I I agree with you and it's it's really interesting the way that you're able to to look into yourself in that way I admire that and yeah you definitely went above and beyond for that gift. That's that's pretty admirable. Um, I think that there are people who believe in you, for sure. Um, maybe they don't have the resource and ability to be able to gift you in the way that you were able to gift your friend. Um, but I think they definitely believe in you. Um, and you're out there. Yeah, it goes really deep. So the reason why there's this element of risk or the reason why I appreciate that so much is because I have the ingrained belief that people are selfish. Yeah. And so I don't want to believe in that, but I believe mm -hmm. in that. And so the reason why the someone taking a risk in you is so moving to me is because it goes against my belief of thinking that people care up to you, care about you up to a certain point until it conflicts with their self-interest. Mm -hmm. Then they will do whatever they care about because people are not truly ever there for each other. So mm -hmm. if someone were to gift to me in the way that I gifted to her, it would prove to me that people aren't just solely selfish human beings. So in a way that gift restores my hope in humanity in some way, mm -hmm. or it restores my faith in humanity. So gifts can go a far away depending on what it means to the person. Yeah. 
yeah no i fully agree with that that makes that makes a lot of sense um well to wrap up with the final love language um that we'll be speaking about but not least physical touch um which before anybody even thinks it um gary chapman actually says that he does not believe that sex is a form of a love language. Um, so physical touch would not fall underneath this, which was interesting because I was thinking about like how like, oh, so would it count, would sex count as physical touch? Would it count as gift? Would it count as quality time? Would it count, you know, like, yeah. So there was a lot of stuff that, you know, I was thinking about acts of service. There's lots of acts of service that you could perform there. Um, you could do words of affirmation there, but maybe that's why it doesn't count. But either way, he said, at least for him, that it, it doesn't it doesn't really count. Um, but uh, it's physical touch from my idea of it is, you know, we all know those people who, when they laugh, like, ha, 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 and then they have to put their hand on your shoulder or someone who just loves to hold your hand, someone who has to like have their head on your shoulder kind of thing, someone who likes to keep their hand on your knee uh, as they're driving maybe, you know, loves hugs, like lots of hugs or, you know, just, just likes being close and physically touched. That communicates its own love at it in, in a way like um, that, that you care for the person, that you, you desire the person, that you, that you want to be close to the person. It makes, it, it closes the gap of connection. Like there is, there is just an electricity that happens when you're sitting down watching a movie together and then all of a sudden the person like reaches and slips their hand into your hand. Now, all of a sudden it's like, we're not just sitting down watching the movie like separately, even though we're physically together kind of thing, but it's like, we're actually together. Like we're even more connected now. Um, and this could annoy a lot of people. So be careful with that. A lot of people hate to be touched, um, but be aware of the people who do like to be touched. Um, and that how that how much of a love language that is and what you're communicating to them because yeah again with the anti love language like if you touch the person if if you avoid touching the person or if they touch you and then you like smack it or whatever like that that's that could be really painful um, but know that that's their way of feeling closer to you more intimate with you um, that's how I view physical touch yeah that's a really good way of putting physical touch. I think that sex should fall under physical touch. I'm the kind of proponent where I rebel against theories in the sense that I don't care what the original creator said. If it makes mm -hmm. more sense to put it under that care category, I'd rather just put it under that category. I actually Honestly, agree with you. Well, I agree with you in the sense that I don't think that it should go under physical touch. I think that it can go under various ones. It depends on where it's coming from with the person. Yeah. But I agree with you in the sense that, oh, it doesn't matter if Gary Chapman said that, I, I still think that it can be applied. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of actions can be put into multiple categories too. I, I don't think a soul thing is necessarily always just that one thing. Um, so I agree with you there too. Um, with physical touch, it's interesting. It can be very reaffirming on a very visceral, animalistic level that, you're close to someone, it's communication beyond words. You know, as human beings, our language was not always this sophisticated. Sometimes when, when we were cavemen, we communicated more through this kind of visceral understanding of each other's bodily signals. And so physical touch can show love in a way in which your brain doesn't have a chance to turn it into language yet. And it can be the most impactful in that way too, where your brain can sometimes short circuit your ability to take in love. But sometimes when you just feel it from someone, you can believe in it more. So, you know, sometimes we talked about earlier about how words of affirmation can create this believability in, in that love. It's like, oh, if you say I love you, then I truly get it because you said it out loud. Physical touch can also give this visceral sense of, feeling loved or cared about beyond what your brain can immediately comprehend, which can bypass circuitries of doubting that love. And so physical touch is nice too, in the sense that it actually has chemical 
signals in your brain, like you get oxytocin or other types of bonding chemicals just from touching someone. And so you yeah, can actually you have- a certain number of hugs every day to like be a fully functioning human being. So like people were like, oh, I hate the hugs. I hate being, like we literally need that for our own health and like well being. Um, and this came from like, I got that information from people who actually don't really enjoy hugs and they looked it up. It's like, oh, wow, well, I guess I have to start hugging people more kind of thing. So yeah, it, it, there's, there's value there. Yeah. And a lot of people go their lives touch starved or the other love languages start like words of affirmation starved gifts starved depending on who you are acts of service starved and then we wonder why we're so grumpy and irritable well it's probably because your needs aren't being met and so denzel what are your thoughts <laughs> yeah no actually i don't have any much more to add to that i think that was pretty straightforward and so just like what joyce said figure out what your needs are and figure out what the people that you love like who the people that you love's needs are um, and how you can meet those needs. Um, what are your love languages? Go ahead and comment that. Um, and give we've we've missed anything on like how to give certain love languages. If you have tips on ways that people can give love languages that maybe we haven't like you know listed here, help some people out in the comments. Um, if you would like coaching from Joyce and I, check out the description. Or if you'd like a profiling session from Joyce and I, check out the description. Um, if you have a suggestion for a video from Joyce and I, then go ahead and drop that in the comments. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching today. And until next time, stay sharp.